Tonight, Judge Brett Kavanaugh is fighting back and standing up for his good name and his reputation, and he's demanding a fair process. He says he won't be intimidated. After days of negotiations with the Senate Judiciary Committee, Professor Christine Ford has now agreed to testify about the allegations she made against Judge Kavanaugh. Let me be perfectly clear. These are serious allegations. I've said it many times. Professor Ford deserves to be heard. And those allegations and accusations should be taken seriously. And this coming Thursday, you, the American people, will be able to hear from both Professor Ford and Judge Kavanaugh in an open setting. Now, Chairman Grassley of the Senate Judiciary Committee, he was right to hold this hearing. And the Republicans have been and are being extremely fair and accommodating, and they're taking these allegations seriously. But tonight, we need to step back, and we need to remember what we're talking about here. These are 35-year-old sexual misconduct allegations made by Professor Ford to congressional Democrats. Now, the claims date back to when Ford and Kavanaugh were in high school. Senator Dianne Feinstein, she was aware of Professor Ford's allegations since July. She sat on them. She kept them a secret until after Kavanaugh's public hearing and after lengthy meetings with Judge Kavanaugh. In fact, Dianne Feinstein refused to give Senate Republicans, her colleagues, the full unredacted letter where the accusations were first made back in July until today. Now, Professor Ford cannot remember a date or location of the alleged incident. The four witnesses that Ford herself listed to corroborate her claims, they are all now on record denying what Ford is alleging. And just a short time ago, Judge Kavanaugh sat down with our own Martha McCallum and categorically refuted these claims once again. Let's take a look. I may have met her. We did not travel in the same social circles. She was not a friend, not someone I knew. You don't remember ever being at parties with her ever? I do not. And this is an allegation about a party in the summer of 1982 at a house near Connecticut Avenue and East West Highway with five people present. I was never at any such party. The other people who are alleged to be present have said they do not remember any such party. A woman who was present, another woman who was present, who is Dr. Ford's lifelong friend, really? has said she doesn't know me and never remembers being at a party with me at any time in her life. All right, tonight, Kavanaugh is now facing one more allegation because over the weekend, The New Yorker, well, they brought up another decades-old claim against Kavanaugh. In this case, a woman named Deborah Ramirez. She's claiming that in the 1980s, again, when he was a freshman in college, that Kavanaugh exposed himself at, to her at a drunken college party at Yale University. Ramirez herself wasn't totally sure if Kavanaugh was the perpetrator. According to The New Yorker, she became, quote, quickly inebriated at the party, her words. She told The New Yorker that she was, quote, foggy and slurring her words. And she even acknowledged that she has significant memory gaps from that evening. Now, The New York Times, well, they spent over a week trying to corroborate her story, talking to dozens of people. And The Times said this, quote, they have interviewed several dozen people over the past week in an attempt to corroborate her story. They could find no one with firsthand knowledge. Ms. Ramirez herself contacted former Yale classmates asking if they recalled the incident and told some of them that she could not be certain Mr. Kavanaugh was the one who exposed himself. And those who Ramirez listed as witnesses in yet another case here, well, to the indecent charges, well, they're all flatly denying. And this is what they said. We can say with confidence that if the incident Debbie alleges ever occurred, we would have seen or heard about it. We did not. The behavior that she describes would be completely out of character for Brett. In addition, some of us knew Debbie Long after Yale. She never described this incident until Brett's Supreme Court nomination was pending. The New Yorker also interviewed Ramirez's best friend at the time of the alleged incident, and she's also denying any knowledge of her claims. And she said, quote, this is a woman I was best friends with. We shared intimate details of our lives. I was never told this story by her or by anyone else. It never came up. I didn't see it. I never heard of it happening. 
Now, Judge Kavanaugh also denied emphatically these decades-old charges in a statement. He wrote, quote, well, these are smears, pure and simple, and they debase our public discourse, but they are also a threat to any man or woman who wishes to serve our country. Such grotesque and obvious character assassination, if allowed to succeed, will dissuade competent and good people of all political persuasions from service. As I told the committee during my hearing, a federal judge must be independent, not swayed by public or political pressure. That is the kind of judge I will always be. I will not be intimidated into withdrawing from this process. The coordinated effort to destroy my good name will not drive me out. The vile threats of violence against my family will not drive me out. The last-minute character assassination will not succeed. And tonight, Kavanaugh once again denied these charges in his interview with Martha. Let's take a look. I never did any such thing. Never did any such thing. The other people alleged to be there don't recall any such thing. If such a thing had happened, it would have been the talk of campus. The women I knew in college and the men I knew in college says it's inconceivable that I could have done such a thing. And the New York Times has reported that just last week, the person making the accusation was calling other classmates, saying she was not sure that I had done this. Again, again, just asking for a fair process where I can be heard and I can defend my integrity. And during this interview, he took it even a step further. Let's watch this. People generally in high school, I think all of us have probably done things we look back on in high school sure. and regret or cringe a bit, but I, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about an allegation of sexual assault. I've never sexually assaulted anyone. I did not have sexual intercourse or anything close to sexual intercourse in high school or for many years thereafter. And the girls uh, from the schools I went to and I uh, were so friends. So you're saying that all, through all these years that are in question, you were a virgin? That's correct. Never had sexual intercourse with anyone in high school? Correct. And through what years in college, since we're probing into your personal many life years, here? Many years after. I'll leave it at that. Many years after. Then Brent Kavanaugh went on to defend his character as a young student at Yale. Watch this. Was there ever a time that you drank so much that you couldn't remember what happened the night before? No. Uh, that never happened. You never said to anyone, I don't remember anything about last night? No. That did not happen. Did you ever have any sense that any kind of the description of the behavior that I just described with these, you know, women being taken into rooms and, and raped or having sex with a number of men, consensual or otherwise, that that was going on at the parties that you were at? I never saw any such thing. Any such thing. I certainly never participated in any such thing, but I never saw or heard of any such thing. And um, you know, we, we were, I was focused on trying to be number one in my class uh, and being captain of the varsity basketball team and doing my service projects, going to church. The, the vast majority of time I spent in high school was studying or focused on sports and being a good friend to the boys and the girls that I was friends with. We have these great lifelong friendships. Now, despite all of these charges, Judge Kavanaugh says he will not be quiet. He is vowing not to be intimidated into withdrawing his nomination. And while Judge Kavanaugh is standing firm, rightly demanding a fair process, it is so important to remember the toll that it also takes on a family. Again, where's the presumption of innocence? Let's take a look. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to have these conversations with your children which we've had to have, um, some broader terms for our youngest, but they know the Brett and they know the truth. And we told them at the very beginning of this process, this will be not fun sometimes. You're gonna hear things that people feel strongly and you need to know that. And just remember, you know your dad. Now, while President Trump, he is standing by his nominee tonight, and he predicted earlier today that, in fact, he will be confirmed. Let's take a look at this. It would be sad, indeed, if something happened to reroute that. This is a fine man, and we certainly hope he's going to be confirmed, and quickly. His family has suffered. His family has suffered. What's going on is not something that should happen. Brett Kavanaugh is an absolute outstanding person. Hopefully, he will be 
confirmed quickly. Now, this all comes as one false smear about Judge Kavanaugh has officially been debunked. The mainstream media, Democrats, were gleefully spreading a rumor that female students were coached by a law professor on how to dress in an outgoing way when they were interviewing with Judge Kavanaugh, a rumor that the professor is completely denying. Now, despite everything we just showed you, and before any public testimony, there are people in this country, this should not be political, Democrats, people on the left, they have already convicted Judge Kavanaugh. And according to them, he has no presumption of innocence, no right to be heard, no reason to be believed, no due process. You know, actually, there are lawmakers, lawmakers that are throwing law out the window and claiming his guilt by accusation. This should not happen in this country. Take a look. The Senate shouldn't simply rely on hearing two conflicting accounts and decide, well, we're okay with not knowing, uh, we're okay with the fact that we might be putting a uh, someone who committed attempted rape on the Supreme Court of the United States. I believe her. Listen, first of all, anybody who comes forward at this point um, to, to, to be prepared to testify in the United States Senate against someone who's being nominated to one of the most powerful positions in the United States government, that takes an extraordinary amount of courage. Not only do women like Dr. Ford, who bravely comes forward, need to be heard, but they need to be believed. They need to be believed. I just want to say to the men of this country, just shut up and step up. Do the right thing. Let me just say right at the outset, I believe Dr. Ford. I believe the survivor here. There's every reason to believe her. She has come forward courageously and bravely. I believe her. I stand with her. And Do you hope I she don't shows she, up on Monday? Do you hope that she no, testifies? I don't think she should be bullied into this scenario where it's a he said, she said. It's a sham hearing. And I, I don't think she should participate in it. I believe Professor Ford. I think she's credible. And I think when the investigation is finished and when she testifies and Judge Kavanaugh testifies, I think a majority of senators will find her credible. And I don't think, I didn't ever thought Kavanaugh should get, get appointed. No presumption of innocence. Now, at the very same time, all the people you're watching here, we have a case not 36, 7, or 5, or 4 years ago where Keith Ellison, the number two person, the number two guy at the DNC, has been accused of repeated physical and emotional abuse. And the DNC has smeared and slandered and ignored the person making that allegation. That's back in August this year. So what you're watching is a Democratic Party playing politics, sadly exploiting a sexual conduct allegation, accusation, that's it, for political gain, jumping to conclusions, rushing to judgment. Now, these are serious allegations, and as I've said, we should hear from the accuser. But tonight, every American, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, this is why you need a healthy dose of skepticism. Let me tell you why. The attorney representing Professor Ford, her name is Deborah Katz, well, has views on sexual assault that have been extraordinarily political and inconsistent at best. For example, she said this about Paula Jones. Nobody in the media reports it. Now, Paula Jones' suit is very, very, very weak, and she alleged one incident that took place in a hotel room that, by her own testimony, lasted 10 to 12 minutes. She suffered no repercussions in the workplace. She then said of Jones' accusations, quote, clearly a one-time incident that took place in 10 to 12 minutes, and she was not forced to have sex. She left of her own volition. The courts increasingly are finding that is not enough to create a sexually hostile work environment claim. And she also defended creepy Senator Al Franken, quote, context is relevant. He did not do this as a member of the U.S. Senate. Yeah, he did. And by the way, he did this in his capacity of someone who is still functioning as an entertainer. Clearly, Professor Ford's attorney has a left-wing, radical, inconsistent political agenda. And the Daily Caller even uncovered back in 2017, the same attorney said she vowed to resist President Trump. We've got the tape. Here it is. 
finally over the finish line. The new attorney general this morning, grateful to the colleagues who fought for him. I can't express how appreciative I am for those of you who've stood by me during this difficult time. We will resist. It was a bitter feud to the very end. We're going to fight back. We are going to resist. We will not be silent. We're going to fight back. We're going to resist. And now we're also learning that Professor Ford is adding one more person to his legal team, an attorney named Michael Bromwich. Uh, he's the lawyer currently representing fired FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe. Now, this brings us to our Hannity history lesson surrounding the Democratic playbook. Now, every two to four years in politics, every election cycle, Democrats use the politics of personal destruction to literally maim the character of their political opponents. Even if it means lying in the process, they demonize all conservatives. It's not a conservative I know that has not been through this. In fact, every four years, every two years, Republicans are racist, sexist, misogynistic, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic. Oh, they want dirty air and water, and they want to kill your children and throw granny over a cliff. Now, the left has also rushed, rushed to judgment in the wake of other major events. They've been wrong. On this program, we've been right. We didn't rush to judgment in the Duke lacrosse case. Remember when the media falsely accused Richard Jewell, the Summer Olympics bombing? Remember? Because they said, oh, he fit the profile of a lone bomber because he lived with his mother. Richard Jewell was listening to my radio show. I was a local host in Atlanta at the time. He once thanked me for being the only one not to rush to judgment. Remember the rush to judgment in Ferguson, in Missouri? You remember the rush to judgment in Baltimore and with Freddie Gray? Uh, remember when Obama said the Cambridge police acted stupidly? You know, we have on this program adopted the we will not rush to judgment. We will wait. We will see. On the case of the Duke lacrosse kids, I went to meet with their parents. In the case of Trayvon Martin, George Zimmerman, I met with George Zimmerman's attorney and George Zimmerman, asked him tough questions. And you see it now every time there's a Supreme Court nominee, well, and it happens to be a president that's Republican that appoints him. We saw it all the time. Judge Bork, we saw it with Clarence Thomas. Politically, remember 2012? Mitt Romney was sexist. He had binders full of women's resumes. And remember, they, they turned his efforts to hire women into an attack about him being a sexist. Mitt Romney was not. Democrats smeared Romney. Remember, they falsely accused him. Remember Harry Reid of being a tax cheat? And then after they won the election, he had no regrets about spe spreading these lies, these false attacks. This happens. This is why Americans have a duty to be skeptical, because the media, the left wing have been wrong. It's in their playbook. We see it every two years, every four years, every Supreme Court nominee, and every big high-profile case that they politicize. Here's a look at uh, Harry Reid. Let him prove that he has paid taxes, because he hasn't. No, I don't regret that at all. The Koch brothers, no one would help me. They were afraid the Koch brothers would go after them. So I did it on my own. So no regrets about Mitt Romney, about the Koch brothers? Because some people have even call, called it McCarthyite. Well, they call it whatever they want. Um, Romney didn't win, did he? I regret telling a total lie and smearing somebody. From Mitt Romney to Robert Bork, to Clarence Thomas, to George Bush. Frankly, every conservative I know that has been forced at some point in their life to deal with these baseless smears, attacks, character assassination. Now, the most often used character assassination in the Democratic playbook is to call Republicans racist. It happens every election season. Take a look. Many Republicans talk in coded racial language about takers and losers. They demonize President Obama and encourage the ugliest impulses of the paranoid fringe. If you accept the support of Klan sympathizers before you are president, you will accept their support after you're president. He's going to let the big banks once again write their own rules. Unchain Wall Street. They're going to put you all back in chains. It's wrong what the leader of the Republican Party and this Congress are doing in blocking 
an accurate census because they don't want to count everyone that they don't think they can count on. They are in favor of affirmative action if you can dunk the basketball or sink a three-point shot. But they're not in favor of it if you merely have the potential to be a leader in your community and bring people together. Don't tell me we've got a colorblind society. June 7, 1998, in Texas, my father was killed. He was beaten, chained, and then dragged three miles to his death, all because he was black. So when Governor George W. Bush refused to support hate crimes legislation, it was like my father was killed all over again. When you don't vote, you let another church explode. When you don't vote, you allow another cross to burn. Real smears, real character assassin, assassination, and it happens predictably every election season, and it happens with Supreme Court nominees. This is gutter politics at its worst, and sadly, we're going to see more and more of these tactics as we now march, what, 43 days or so towards the midterms. We're going to have a lot more on this in a moment. But first, breaking today, it also appears the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein is hanging on to his job, at least for now. After the New York Times issued a report accusing Rod Rosenstein, and they're sticking by it, of plotting to secretly record President Trump and planning to rally cabinet officials and evoke, invoke the 25th Amendment, Rumors spread that Rosenstein might be out of a job. That was going on all morning this morning. Tonight, Rod Rosenstein has been in communication with the president, and apparently they will be meeting on Thursday.